Hello. Thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's Trademark and Copyright Webinar entitled TCAB Update, New Rule Changes, Practice Tips, and Recent Notable Cases. My name is Cindy Walden and I'm a principal in our Boston office. And today I'll be presenting with my colleague Bob O'Connell of Council in our Boston office. For those of you who are interested, our bios are available in the handout section of the webinar widget. Today's webinar will run for one hour, and it includes a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions at any time throughout the program by clicking on the question section on the widget to submit your question. We will do our best to answer them all at the end of the presentation, time permitting. Please also feel free to contact us personally after the webinar if that's easier. Before I get started, we should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court in every situation. The materials for this presentation will be available post this webinar on our website. So without further ado, um, let's get started. There we go. Okay, so um, here's the agenda of things that we're hoping to cover today. Um, we'll start with an overview of how things are going at the TTAB. We'll talk about the new TTAB rule changes. We will talk about some strategic considerations at the TTAB um, post the B&B hardware case. And we'll also go over some recent significant cases and trends. And I will hand it over to Bob to start off with what's going on at the TTAB lately. All right, good afternoon. So there have been a few personnel changes in the past year at the board. Uh, one judge, Judge Searman, has retired. One of her favorite issues was surname cases, and we're going to talk about that later. Uh, two or three, rather, new judges have been added uh, in the past. 13 months, uh, Judge Coggins, Judge Larkin, and Judge Paula Georges. That brings the full complement of uh, judges on the board to 26, and uh, they currently have 14.6 full-time equivalents for interlocutory attorneys. And I, I believe that there was talk at the, at the board that they're going to be hiring again uh, because they have targets that they're trying to meet on pendency that we're going to talk about now in the next slide. Um, first, we thought we'd start out with some of the interesting statistics about um, the TGB uh, metrics over the last year in terms of uh, workload and decisions. Um, and on the slide here, we have the statistics displayed. Um, last year, 3,121 um, new appeals were filed. 5,881 oppositions were filed, and 1,848 cancellations were filed. Um, that's up um, anywhere from 4 to 11 percent from 2015 numbers, depending on which type of action. Um, 2017 Q1 filings are at or slightly higher than 2016, so the trend continues. Um, we also have some interesting um, statistics on currently pending matters. There are, you can see, quite a few. Um, 1,441 appeals are currently pending at the TTB. Um, as a counterpoint to that, um, in 2016, 528 appeals were decided. Um, and currently pending oppositions number uh, roughly of 5,414. Um, and, and cancellation actions um, a little over 1,500. Um, the trial cases that were decided in 2016 only number 158. So you can see that um, while there are many, many matters that have been filed or pending, um, not as many actually make it through the trial and decision. Uh, another statistic from last year is that 23 accelerated case resolution or ACR cases were decided. Um, and uh, it's anticipated those numbers may fall off a little bit with the new rule, um, but an interesting uh, data point nonetheless. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out was um, the TTAB has a dashboard, and we have a link to it here on the slide, um, where you can review graphics uh, regarding pendency, new filing, inventory, appeals, age of pending motions by type of motion, et cetera. Some really, um, I think, nice looking graphics and some interesting detail on um, the status of things at the TTAB. And Bob's going to talk about, I think, a few of the statistics that um, 
relate to dependency of matters that um, you can also see on the TCAB um, dashboard. Bob? Yes. So the board has been consistently setting targets for pendency of uh, final decisions and also contested motions, and they keep, you know, inching them inch by inch toward shorter shorter wait periods. And for the past couple of years, they have been close to, if not slightly, beating their targets. And right now, as of now, their total pendency times, I should say as of 2016, they're deciding appeals from filing to decision on an average of 39.7 weeks. Trial cases, however, are still at 154 th weeks. That's you know essentially three three years and change. ACR trial cases are getting decided in just under two years at 98 weeks. Currently, according to the board's own statistics, they're deciding contested motions in seven and a half weeks from briefing to decision and final decisions in just uh, 7.3 weeks. I think my own experience is that it's taking them longer, but this is what the numbers say. What they have currently fully briefed and awaiting decisions are 89 appeals and 29 trial cases. Great. Next slide. Please, there we go. Great. Um, so we also thought we'd take a quick look at the appellate record that the TGB has. Um, and it looks like they were four and three in the um, federal circuit in the past year, uh, which includes one decision that was issued on January 4, 2017. But that probably wasn't written over the New Year's weekend. So <laughs> we've, we've wrapped that in. Um, so uh, starting with affirmances, Bob, did you want to go over a few of those? Yeah, the highlights, the Emerald Cities collaborative case against uh, Rose or Reese, that was a case, a cancellation case where the grounds for cancellation were abandonment on account of the fact that the application, when it was still a pending ITU application, had been assigned. And it had not been assigned properly along with the, uh, you know, all or substantially all of the assets of the business that it was tied to. And so the registration was canceled and the, the federal sort, circuit affirmed that. In the Prima Gioti Light case, uh, that was a case involving a mark that was 660 words long. It really wasn't a mark at all, and it had been refused based on failure to function as a trademark. Pretty straightforward, and that was affirmed as well. Bob, well, that looks like that was a it was like a flyer. Yeah, the, the mark. It just for some context. Yeah, the specimen in the, in the case was essentially the whole mark on a sheet of paper and it did look like a flyer or something and it was sort of an explanatory, very long explanatory slogan for this person's business. In the Oakville Hill Cellar case, the court affirmed the board's uh, finding that the marks Maya and Mayari are not confusingly similar for wine. Uh, which in some cases is, some, some might say is kind of surprising because particularly in alcohol cases, it seems like the board typically bends over to find confusing similarity. But in this case, no, because the marks were pronounced significantly differently. And Maya has a distinct meaning of its own that Mayari does not have. And then the Cordura restaurant case is interesting because it was one of those cases where it kind of highlights the, uh, I don't know, you'd call it Kafka-esque or maybe Dickensian aspect of TTAB practice because the party, uh, the applicant here had a registration for the word churrascos in standard characters that had been registered. They filed an application for the same mark, the same word, but in stylized font, and this one got refused for being not only descriptive but generic, notwithstanding the stylization. And the applicant pointed with, I think, some justifiable frustration at its prior registration, but that was unavailing. If it's generic, it's generic. And that was that as far as the board was concerned. And the 
the, and the uh, Federal Circuit affirmed that. Um, and we had a few examples, the reversals um, for the Federal Circuit this year. The first one is the one I mentioned that was just issued at the beginning of 2017, but we've included it. Um, here is an interesting point, um, the NRA driven innovations case, it reversed the TTAB finding that the mark.blog was merely descriptive for online information services. And the Federal Circuit in that case held that the word dot, D-O-T, does not immediately convey a meaning um, of the punctuation in, a, in an internet domain. So uh, they reversed the, the TTAB finding that otherwise uh, .blog has to refer to a um, a blog at a website address. Um, another reversal was the NRA Job Diva Inc. case where the TTAB um, found that, um, where it vacated the TTAB finding a partial abandonment over the distinction between um, software as a service and analog rendering of services. In that case, um, the Job Diva mark covered uh, the identification of services with personnel and place, placement and recruitment services. Um, but what the company really was doing was offering software as a service to help um, one uh, render those services. So they weren't actually rendering the services themselves, they were simply providing software as a service. So I thought that was an interesting case to mention, um, focusing on really what the consumer's perception would be of what the service is. Um, and then finally, the Christian Faith Fellowship Church versus Adidas case. Um, the Federal Circuit reversed the TTAB holding of the sale of two hats at um, a church bookstore to an out-of-state customer constituted interstate commerce. And I won't go into detail on that now because we have another slide um, coming on that one a little bit, but that was a very interesting case um, and reversal this year. So before we go into some more of the cases and the presidential cases that we were going to talk about this year, we thought we would um, go over the new TTAB rule changes that became effective at the beginning of this year. And they were effective on January 14th, and it's both prospective and retrospective. So the rule changes apply to proceedings not only filed on or after January 14th, but also proceedings that were already in progress, which is a change from the last time the rules were updated. and. The feeling at the board was that it just made more sense to have the same sets of rules apply to every case rather than old rules applying to some cases and new rules applying to other cases. And so at the same time, the, uh, the trademark uh, board's manual procedure was also updated consistent with the rules. And the board has a number of resources on their website. We've got a link up there to one of them. Uh, with both the full text of the new rules and also uh, different documents with highlights and comparisons and helpful tips and things like that. And um, Chief Judge Rogers recently spoke at an event here in Boston and he emphasized on the, um, on the point about having the new rules apply to cases and actions um, that the board fully understands that that may require. Um, the, the interlocutory um, attorneys and the judges to wait in and maybe make some um, decisions with respect to leeway in certain situations, but um, they did want to have a consistent approach and have the same rules. Okay, so um, one of the big new rules is that e-filing is now mandatory. All submissions must be made electronically through the EFTTA um, website system. Exceptions only for complaints, answers, and extensions of opposition deadlines, um, and only if extraordinary circumstances can be shown, and that includes issues with the ESTA filing system or firm computer system. Um, they did note uh, in a recent um, presentation on the rule changes that um, a system at the GTV does go down from time to time, but usually it's not for a very long time, and so encouraged um, you, if you have time, to check again in another hour or two. Um, I know when we're down to the wire, sometimes that's hard to do, but um, it's important, obviously, to make sure that you leave enough time to deal with some of these issues. And if there is a glitch at the last minute, you do need to file um, a written paper explaining um, with a petition to the director and a $100 fee as to why you are not filing through the ESSA system. 
Um, one, one thing, important thing to note is also there are no exceptions if the mark involved is a Madrid filing, if this rule applies to everything. Um, and the TTB will also uh, review and verify claims of the asset outages against their own records. So just keep that in mind. As another part of the rule changes, the board is now reverting to the prior practice where the board itself will serve copies of initial pleadings on the other party. We, we as parties no longer have to do that ourselves if we're in the position of the plaintiff. And so we file our initial pleadings electronically through ESTA. The board will then serve those via email to the last known email address for the contact person for the applicant or registrant. And part of the ESTA form has been updated to give the plaintiff an opportunity to plug in the most recent known email address if it's different from what's in the PTO's files. As I said, this is a return to practice before the last rule changes in 2007, and the ESTA forms have been updated. Next slide. Okay, so another big change is um, no more service by mail. Um, contrary to prior practice where um, you must seek uh, consent and stipulation of the other side to serve by email, that's now been flipped on its head. And so service of all submissions and papers in inter parties cases must be made by email unless the parties agree otherwise. Um, service should not be made by first class mail, hand delivery, or overnight courier or other means unless the parties both agree. And if the serving party encounters technical difficulties or extraordinary circumstances in serving by email, um, again, you must provide a written explanation um, that email service was attempted but could not be made and why. Um, another thing that the uh, TJV is doing to encourage uh, efficiency um, with respect to um, the process is uh, when service of voluminous or large electronic file sizes is impractical through email, they encourage parties to use alternative methods of electronic service such as Dropbox, USB drives, and other methods of service um, as agreed upon between the parties. So hand in hand with the um, doing away with the service by first class mail um, or couriers, you also now no longer have an extended response period. Um, previously you had an extra five days if you um, served by first class mail, priority mail, or overnight courier, but that is no longer the case. All 30-day response deadlines are now fixed to 30 days. Um, however, all 15-day response and reply deadlines for briefing a motion have been amended to 20 days. Another feature of the new rules which kind of sharpens the requirement that was already there is that uh, oppositions in Madrid protocol applications, the ESTA cover sheet controls the grounds of the opposition and the substance of it and not the underlying pleading. That is a switch from what has historically been the case with respect to domestic applications where it's the underlying pleading that controls. But on Madrid applications, because they ha everything has to be electronic, the ESTA cover sheet is going to control with respect to grounds for opposition and uh, well, which goods and services are opposed, who the named opposer is, and so on. And once, you, once that's filed, once you click submit, that's it. It cannot be amended after it's filed under any circumstances. So this is a big change, and particularly for um, proceedings that are already in process, this is one um, you definitely want to make note of and incorporate in your strategy for moving forward with discovery. And that is that um, the new rules uh, require that not only must discovery requests be served before the close of discovery, but all responses, objections, and documents must be served and produced on or before the close of discovery. Um, discovery requests must be made early enough so that um, they can be served, the responses and documents can be served by the close of discovery. And this is a change from current procedure where um, up till now, 
Um, discovery could be served up to the last day and responses or documents or objections could be served after the close of discovery. So this is a big change again, this will require planning and cooperation amongst the parties, particularly with respect to document production, because you can no longer respond or on the deadline saying the documents will be made available at a mutually agreeable time and place. Um, so again, this is I think one of the biggest changes with respect to procedure and one, um, again, if there are proceedings in process where you have discovery outstanding, uh, you may need to get the DTB to, to wait in on. Another change to discovery rules is that there are new limits on written discovery. Now interrogatories, document requests, and requests for admissions are limited to 75, counting all subparts. Uh, previously, document requests and requests for admissions were not limited. Uh, this is a change that I'm not entirely in favor of because I think requests for admissions can be really helpful in narrowing issues, and so I like to use them a lot. Uh, the one exception is that the board will permit a single extra sort of comprehensive set of requests for admissions solely for the purposes of authenticating documents. But apart from that, it's 75. You can uh, file a motion, but you have to show good cause for exceeding the limit. So it would have to be an exceptionally complicated or fact-intensive case. Another rule change to be mindful of is that certain motions must now be filed earlier. Um, motions to compel discovery, motions to test the sufficiency of responses or objections, and motions for summary judgment must all be pro filed prior to the plaintiff's pretrial disclosure. Um, a few other notes on summary judgment motions we have here. Um, rule 56D motions must be filed within the 30 days of service of summary judgment motion, and there are no extensions. The board discourages reply briefs and surplies will not be considered. And the board has come out with a statement that they discourage summary judgment motions on fraud claims. Moving to the trial section on inter-parties cases, huge change is that now the board will accept trial testimony by affidavit or declaration. You no longer have to do trial testimony depositions. However, the witness has to be made available if the other side wants to cross-examine that witness. So it's not just a free shot uh, to put in anything you want by affidavit or declaration. That being said, I think it does potentially open the door to abuse because it will be a little bit easier to put in questionable testimony if you've got an opponent who maybe doesn't want to spend the time and money to cross-examine. It also raises uh, seventh uh, Amendment issues with respect to the BNB, or BNB hardware case because if these issues determined at the TTAB are going to be preclusive in a civil case involving use and potentially damages, you haven't had an opportunity to cross-examine your witnesses. And so there's a constitutional issue there. The board has also instituted some new technical rules for submitting uh, testimony deposition transcripts. Uh, you have to file them electronically, but they have to be full size. Uh, you can't have multiple pages on a page. You have to have a word index. Also, notices of reliance have to include specific statements explaining the relevance of each proffered item as to a particular issue. And that's similar to what the existing practice has been, but they've sharpened it because I think they've observed that people were getting a little bit too lax about explaining things in their notices of reliance. So now you've got to be specific about, you know, this document is relevant to this particular issue because X. Uh, you, you've got to really spell things out. Um, another change to make note of, um, in keeping with, I guess, the board's uh, desire to keep things moving along, but I suspect also to have um, a source of revenue for those who aren't uh, making up their minds about uh, filing oppositions uh, within a short time frame, is that the PTO will now charge fees for filing requests for extension of opposition deadlines. 
The first 30-day extension, if you just file a 30-day extension up front, is still no charge. Um, but after that, um, a second 60-day extension is $100 per application. If you file electronically, if you file on paper, it's $200 per application. So you can see they're increasing the price tag there. Um, if you file an initial 90-day extension, so you don't go for the initial free 30-day extension, um, there is a $100 fee per application. And again, if you file on paper, a $200 fee per application. And then a final 60-day extension is $200 per application. If filed on paper, it's $300 per application. So um, I think this is really trying to incentivize people to decide whether you're going to oppose or not and move on with it rather than to extend and extend and extend without any repercussions. So a few tips to kind of take away from the rule changes. One is that you should make sure your owner and contact information on all your registrations are up to date in the PTO system uh, because you want to make it, well, usually you want to make it easy for the board and potential petitioners to reach you and serve you properly at the right address. Uh, second tip is you want to be mindful that these rule changes apply to pending proceedings. And so this could, as Cindy mentioned a few minutes ago, this could require adjusting your strategy and timing, particularly with respect to getting discovery out in time to be completed before the close of discovery, and also to get your summary judgment motion ready to file sooner before the other side's pretrial disclosures. Another um, practice tip is to double and triple check your uh, the cover sheet for new pleadings um, because amendment can be difficult or impossible later. Um, and also to be uh, careful about your page limits because they cannot be extended. Um, and I just added another one that's not on the slide here, which is to make decisions about whether to file oppositions within the first 30 days to avoid extension fees. And I guess the other comment I'd make about extensions too is that uh, the board and its uh, rollout of these rules has made it clear that they're going to make it more difficult to get extensions and in some places, in some instances, certain things cannot be extended and they seem to be taking a harder line in an effort to move cases along more quickly. So we thought we'd spend a few moments talking about strategies for the new um, TKB landscape. There are a few recent developments outlined on the slide here that really evidence the fact that the ground has shifted a bit. And um, these three developments really should be considered when um, bringing TTP actions and when um, litigating them, because things have changed a bit um, from practice over the last um, decade or two. The BNB hardware case, uh, which many of you presumably have heard about at this point, um, was a case decided uh, back in 2015, but held that the decisions of the TTP can have a preclusive effect on subsequent civil litigation, providing, provided the other uh, ordinary elements of issue preclusion are present. So it's really raised the stakes in TTAB cases um, with respect to the admission of evidence and um, the discussion of issues. Um, another uh, fundamental case that has uh, shifted the, the playing field a bit is the Shamus versus um, Ocarino case, um, which uh, involved parties seeking de novo review of TTAB decisions in district courts um, and how the, uh, the party must now pay the PTO's expenses and attorney fees in those matters. And it upholds the 2013 shift in PTO policy. Before that, the PTO only sought costs. Now they also um, seek reimbursement for uh, attorney fees. And it's more incentive, really, to get all your evidence in at the TTAB so that you don't need to go for a day and review at the district court level. Um, and then finally, um, the 2017 TTAB rule changes that we just went over. They're really intended to make proceedings faster and less expensive, and I think um, in many respects they'll be helpful, although there probably will be some growing pains for getting used to them um, for people that are used to dealing with the old system. And we're also still getting used to life after particularly B&B hardware. You know, I think in the long-term impacts of that decision, I think, still remain to be seen. One thing that we have seen, as mentioned earlier, is that inter-parties filings at the board are still going up, uh, upwards of around 10% in 
in 2016, and they're at an even slightly higher pace so far in 2017. So people have not yet been discouraged from filing at the TTAB by the fact that the decision might potentially be preclusive. And that's, but that's a decision now that has to be thought through a lot more carefully than it did before. You know, how much confidence do you have in the TTAB judges as opposed to district court judges in a, in a trademark case? You know, do you want the specialists at the board or do you want the Article III judges to take a look at your cases? You also need to think about whether you want to preserve your record in a way that makes preclusion either more or less likely. If you want to get as complete a record as possible, that you know might be beneficial if you've obviously if you win, and it all, and it also would be beneficial because it could eliminate the need to go that intermediate step for de novo, de novo review under Section 1071B at the district court. And again, you've got to think about how confident you are in your case at the beginning, because you know, if, if that decision is preclusive, you want it to be preclusive in your favor. Alternatively, do, the, do you do the opposite? And you try to restrict the record in your TTAB case as much as possible, keep out evidence on marketplace factors and things like that, so that you have the opportunity to get that extra bite at the apple, either in district court and introduce more evidence there, or in your appeal, or later on in civil litigation, where you can argue that, oh wait, the TTAB decided different issues than what's going on here because of these different facts, and because of the limitations on what the board was looking at, and, avo and hopefully avoid issue preclusion. And again, if you lose, I mean, those are the same factors you need to consider. Uh, do you want to spend the money to go to district court in order to strengthen your record, even though it means it's going to be more expensive now under the Shamus case, or do you go straight to the CAFC? Either way, win or lose, you know, strong case, weak case, uh, big record, small record, parties have to think about these things at the beginning and before they file anywhere, because the board the board is no longer you know, a less expensive first bite at the apple in trademark disputes. And just a few more points on the issue preclusion factors. Um, one is to keep in mind issue preclusion under B&B hardware doesn't just apply to the ultimate issue of likelihood of confusion. It's also been um, how to apply the determination of priority of use. And it could apply to abandonment, genericness, descriptiveness, acquired distinctiveness, functionality. Um, and presumably, it could also apply to other DuPont factors that don't hinge on extrinsic evidence. So now we thought we would move on to talk about um, recent noteworthy TTAB decisions. Um, and actually starting with uh, the Christian Faith Fellowship Church versus Adidas case that I mentioned previously. Right, and this isn't a TTAB decision, it's a Federal Circuit decision, but it overturned a TTAB case, as mentioned earlier. And as Cindy said, the Federal Circuit here held that the sale of two, just two hats at a church's bookstore in Illinois to a Wisconsin resident constituted use in commerce. Adidas had claimed that the mark hadn't been used in commerce and had been abandoned, uh, and the only evidence that uh, the, the the church could come up with was a receipt for the sale of these two hats. The board had said that that was de minimis and insufficient to affect commerce, but the Federal Circuit reversed, uh, relying basically on a bunch of cases that emphasized the breadth of Congress's Commerce Clause powers. And they've reasoned that proof of actual effect on interstate commerce is not needed. And so the upshot of this case seems to be that there, there is very little commerce left that Congress can't regulate and that isn't interstate commerce for trademark purposes. The bar to alleged use is now as 
about as low as you can get. I suppose we would need a case about one hat uh, to <laughs> test that. All right, another case, a uh, couple, couple cases actually about uh, ownership of marks among related companies. In the Noble House case, uh, the, a mark was canceled because the mark was owned by the subsidiary, but the party that was actually using the mark was the parent. And the registrant subsidiary didn't have any either informal, either legal or contractual controls in terms of licenses or anything else to control the use of the mark and the quality and all that. Under those particular facts, the board held that the parent is not a related company, and so its use of the mark, and it was sporadic at best, did not inure to the benefit of the registrant, and so the mark was held to be abandoned. And so the lesson there is, you know, if you've got multiple affiliated companies in your corporate family tree, using marks, you want to make sure that you've got internal licenses and other controls in place to make sure that that, uh, that, that use by affiliated entities is properly documented and controlled. Now the counterpoint to that case uh, was another presidential case by the board last year, uh, Wise versus Allstate. There the board stated that it's possible for a family of marks to be owned by different entities within the same corporate family if unified control is shown. So the, the obvious uh, unifying element in those cases is that you've got to have uh, control over use of the mark in one place, and it's got to be the right place. So just a few minutes. Um, it seems like we're hearing more and more about these cases and with state legislation um, uh, also coming into the news lately. We thought we mentioned the three presidential cases involving goods or services related to marijuana. Um, and in all three of the cases that I'll here, the TTAB um, was not willing to step into the fray um, to discuss issues um, related to the Controlled Substances Act, other than to um, say that it is not lawful use in commerce, if it's not lawful under federal law. Um, this first case here was the Mark um, Herbal Access, and it was for retail store services featuring herbs. Um, but when uh, reviewing the specimens, it became quite clear that the herbs were, in fact, cannabis. <laughs> Um, and so um, the registration was refused for uh, not being lawful use in commerce. The second um, uh, case here, the marks involved were powered by Juju and Juju joints, and the goods were marijuana vaporizers, which also were held to be illegal under the Controlled Substances Act, um, and therefore unlawful use. And the third case um, involved the mark Home Hemp Health, where the applicant argued the refusal wasn't proper. If some of the goods were legal, um, but the applicant failed to address the descriptiveness and misdescriptiveness issues, and so the board affirmed on those grounds. All right, we've got a case now involving a consent agreement that was submitted by an applicant, which the board reviewed and uh, which is unusual, rejected. And those are the marks they're up on the screen now, Time Traveler Blonde and Time Traveler, both for beer. In the case of Inri Bay State Brewing, and the applicant submitted a coexistence agreement with uh, the following terms, that the marks would only be used with house marks, that the applicant would never use time traveler or traveler without blonde, blonde always has to appear the same size as time traveler, and just to go back, it's questionable whether that label that you see there is compliant. Uh, the parties will always use different trade dresses, which they clearly were doing so. And, and this turned into a key thing, the applicant committed that it would only use his mark in New England and New York, but there was no geographic restriction on the, on the prior user and registrant. The board rejected the agreement. They said that the uh, limitations on font size and trade dress and things like that in house marks were inconsistent with the fact that this application was for a standard character mark with no geographic limitation. Similarly, the restrictions on geography were inconsistent with the unlimited nature of the registration and also 
wouldn't reduce the likelihood of confusion because there was still overlap with both parties in New England and New York. I think what was really going on here was that the board thought that the marks were just too similar for the same goods and they were going to reject that agreement you know, even if the parties were doing a lot of the right things. So the upshot obviously is don't assume the TTAB will automatically accept your consent agreement. They do actually read them. And you know, another case came out uh, a week or so ago on these things, on consent agreements that indicates that it may not be as easy as you think to get a consent agreement approved. A couple of discovery cases among the presidential decisions last year at the board. Uh, the lesson should be obvious, don't play games and engage in gauge, gamesmanship in discovery. In the in-tax recreation case, uh, the respondent had produced documents in redacted form, uh, unilaterally blacking out a whole bunch of material that it, in its own wisdom, deemed to be irrelevant or confidential. The board ruled that, no, you can't do that. You have to produce unredacted documents. If there's stuff that's confidential, that's what the protective order is for. And you can't decide what's relevant or not because the receiving party is entitled to be able to look at uh, these documents with the complete context. More egregious case uh, was an Emilio Pucci case. One day before the discovery responses were due, uh, a counsel for the uh, respondent had tried to get an extension and when, when was unable to do so, they simply moved for a protective order as to all written discovery, sort of a blanket boilerplate motion with no citation to authority and no real cause shown. The board ruled that no, the proper course under these circumstances was to, is to respond to the, to the discovery and object. And the board was so unimpressed with the respondent in this case that they issued sanctions, which is very unusual. And the respondent was uh, barred from filing any more unconsented motions in the case without prior leave of the board. And they also got a show cause order uh, to show why all their objections to discovery should not be waived and all requests for admission should be deemed admitted. So. You know, this was this was a in particular a case where the board really got ticked off at what it felt was unjustified game playing in discovery. So there were two cases involving fraud issues. Um, the first one here was actually maybe also more of a race judicata claim, but a fraud claim. But um, in this case, the um, a Section 15 declaration was filed while the TTV and district court cases were pending. And of course, the Section 15 declaration includes representation that you know of, uh, that the mark is, is not subject to any current challenge. Um, in that case, um, the respondent filed for summary judgment on the basis of race judicata because in the prior proceeding, the fraud claim was not raised, um, but the TTV held that the prior claim related to different facts because it was um, the issue of whether there was a connection with a living individual and not a fraud claim. And so uh, summary judgment was denied and the case proceeded. Um, and the other case here involved uh, two different entities with the last name Quirk um, being used in connection with auto dealerships and auto um, suppliers. And in that case, a fraud claim was alleged based on finding a declaration that they knew of no other superior rights, but if they were aware of the other registration um, these two entities were operating, operating in two different states, and I think this case um, underlines the fact that the TTV really, you know, requires very specific evidence of um, a, an intent to defraud the USPTO, not just that based on the circumstances involved, clearly you should have known better, clearly it, you know, smells like fraud, you actually have to have evidence uh, of a specific intent to deceive, and that's in keeping, I think, with recent cases. There are uh, a few cases involving procedural issues and evidentiary failure, um, and the theme uh, on a couple that, were out, that are outlined here um, were that really it's, it's so important 
um, particularly with TTV cases, to know the rules and to follow them and to make sure that you plead your case carefully. Um, the first case here is the um, NH Beach Pizza LLC versus Christie's Pizza case, and it was a cancellation action against um, the Mark Beach Pizza on the grounds of genericism. And the, uh, the issue there was whether the dismissal without prejudice um, has a preclusive effect on is issues actually litigated. There was a prior cancellation action that was dismissed for lack of standing, and um, there were no genuine issues of fact, material to preclusion that were presented. So the Federal Circuit has held that dismissal for lack of standing should be without prejudice, um, but the failure to introduce evidence is immaterial in that case um, to whether there's a finding of collateral estoppel. And um, I think one thing that's noted uh, along the lines of what Bob said about, you know, don't, don't play games in the, the TTAB is also, you know, use the procedural options that the rules afford. And in this case, they didn't. In this case, um, the party uh, could have appealed the board's decision and would have allowed more time to introduce new evidence and discuss those issues. Um, the other case here <coughs> is um, in Ray Jimmy Moore LLC. The mark applied for was pitching smart. The services were entertainment in the nature of baseball games. Um, this is a case where really the services were not properly defined from the get-go. The services that um, really were being offered was a game for teaching baseball and softball pitching skills, not um, baseball game entertainment services. So um, they, nonetheless, the party, um, the applicant dug in and tried to, you know, wordsmith and argue why um, changing the description of services to what they were actually doing wasn't broadening and the board um, wasn't listening, um, and a couple notes here. One, I thought this quote was interesting. The board does not take judicial notice of records residing in the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, the other was the judicial notice. Uh, they were asked to take judicial notice of definitions from Wikipedia, which were not surprisingly denied. Um, but the board did know Wikipedia evidence can be made of record when submitted timely, and the other side has an opportunity to rebut. There were three surname refusals at the board last year. And it's interesting because it shows what has been a, a long kind of twisted progression with respect to the board's jurisprudence on surname cases. And as I mentioned before, Judge Searman, who recently retired, uh, this was a big hobby horse of hers. And she felt that rareness of the surname ought to be the prime in, in many possibly overriding factor. And her voice won't be present anymore, and so we've got some unusual results now. Uh, the Eximius Coffee case and the Integrated Embedded case were pretty straightforward. One involved a rare surname, uh, Aldecoa, the other a more common surname, Barr, but in both cases the applicant promoted themselves on their labels and websites and things like that emphasizing the role of the founders who are still involved in the business and actively involved in the management and providing the goods and services. So it was pretty straightforward refusal there and easy for the, for the board to find that the, these marks were primarily merely surnames because it was obvious. On the other hand, you had the Adlon case, which is an extremely rare surname. I think less than 100 were found people who have that surname. There was evidence of long-term use as a trademark outside the USA for the Grand Hotel in Berlin. But the board, what the board seemed to do was create this burden shifting thing where once the examining attorney was able to show that it's a surname, even if it's only for a few people, then the burden is on the applicant to prove that, it ha that it's something else. And if the applicant can't do that, then the, then the refusal would be upheld. Uh, Judge Quinn in a dissent said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you have to look at the mark in context, and if there was no contextual clues that pointed to the mark being a surname, then you can't assume that it will be perceived as such. But uh, nevertheless, that's where we're at in terms of the most recent precedential surname case. So there were a couple of trade dress cases that were um, presidential decisions decided by the TTV this past year. Um, the first one listed here is NRA Fantasia Distribution, Inc. 
Um, and the trade dress involved was a repeating diamond pattern around the base of an electronic hookup. Um, and uh, the mark was refused on the basis it was not inherently distinctive. It was held to be merely ornamental, a merely ornamental shape in an unremarkable pattern placed on the goods in an unremarkable way. Um, there was some discussion about how um, even the way uh, the products were packaged obscured the pattern and there was nothing in the advertising to tout the pattern and the fact that other electronic hookups also had patterns on them that were unremarkable um, such that it was more you know, ornamental. And there was not um, really evidence of record to support the claim that um, there was sufficient acquired distinctiveness. The other trade dress case is NRA Loggerhead Tools, LLC, um, and that was a motion mark. Um, and the motion mark was of a hand tool with six rectangular jaw-like elements um, moving. <laughs> and it was affirmed on the basis, um, the denial of that registration was affirmed on the basis that the mark was functional. And in that um, decision, the, uh, the TKB looked at a uh, uh, utility patent for the product and also the fact that the advertising has the utilitarian advantages of the features of the product to come to that decision. Um, related to trade dress, there was a uh, color case this year. Right. Bob was going to mention. Right. The the counterpoint on trade dress cases is that we had a rare uh, affirmance, or I should say, reversal of a refusal on color. The board allowed the registration of the color white as applied to preformed gunpowder charges, and there the applicant really did their homework and did a great job of getting the kind of evidence they needed into the record. They were able to show that making gunpowder white is not natural and in fact costs more, uh, that they did lots of look for advertising, and they had a survey showing over 90% recognition of the mark. And so based on that record, the board found that they had established acquired distinctiveness for this color mark, and they allowed it to be registered. In the case there is Inri Hodgson Powder Company. Um, there were a number of descriptiveness refusals that were upheld by the um, TKB in this past year. Um, there were a couple I thought that were worth noting, um, and certainly the overarching um, observation is that the USPTO is really keen on um, highlighting descriptiveness issues. The first case um, we have here is the In Re Morinaga Nyoko Kamishiki Kaisa, excuse my pronunciation, um, case where the mark, um, the two parties marks were, the applicant's mark was Mount Rainier, the mountain of Seattle espresso and milk, which is uh, depicted on the slide at the bottom there. And the um, owner of the, um, the registered mark uh, owned the mark for Mount Rainier Coffee Company. And, um, and in that case, uh, the board really had a fairly lengthy discussion about um, you know, generic and highly descriptive terms embodied in the mark. Um, espresso and milk co and coffee company were of little trademark significance. Um, and talking about how coffee drinks, most every place that sells them, has espresso and milk, and you can um, you know, view those as having very little significance. I think the reason why this case was um, so, so the, the court ultimately affirmed the 2D refusal based on the similarity of the marks but um, reversed on the issue of uh, geographic descriptiveness. And that, I believe, is why this case was precedential, that um, the TTV held that the mark as a whole was not primarily geographically deceptively misdescriptive based on the reference to Seattle um, in the mark, and uh, that you're not just looking at um, parsing out the mark and looking at particular terms. It has to be the overall impression of the mark. Um, another interesting point in this case, uh, and frustrating I'm sure for the applicant, was um, that the similar terms between the applied for mark and the registered mark, Mount Rainier and Mount Rainier with MT as the abbreviation, um, were both descriptive. And in fact, the um, registered mark um, has a number of registrations and, um, and, and had disclaimed Mount Rainier as being descriptive. Um, another uh, important point was that um, the the registered mark, one of the prior marks was on the re supplemental register, 
Um, but the board held that a likelihood of confusion can still be found even if the term is merely descriptive and doesn't identify source. And um, that relates back to uh, a federal circuit um, decision from, from years ago um, where it held the presumption um, of a mark on the re supplemental register does not constitute an admission that the mark is not acquired distinctiveness. So this is a bit of a frustrating, I think, decision for certainly the applicant in this case because um, the reason you're on the supplemental register is because the USPTO is saying that you know it doesn't function as a mark, but may be capable of doing so, um, and yet it still can be held as a bar to subsequent file um, applications. And so you know I think a practice tip there probably is to go ahead and file for and secure registrations at the very least on the supplemental register that may help you. Um, in your case, of building up acquired distinctiveness and keeping others out of the marketplace. Okay, moving on. Next slide, we have another case, um, NRA LC Trademarks, Inc. In that case, uh, the registration of Deep Deep Dish Pizza was refused on the basis it was merely descriptive and had not acquired distinctiveness, and mere ownership of a series of similar marks doesn't suffice to establish a family of marks. Um, and in that case, the family of marks alleged was a family of marks with repeating terms. Some of you may be familiar with the Little Caesar um, Pizza Pizza <laughs> and other mark themes. So um, again, relating, I guess, to the issue of family of marks, but also um, the need to really uh, prove uh, distinctiveness in, in cases where the terms are highly descriptive. So to wrap things up, we had a few um, TTAB practice tips takeaways from these presidential decisions for the first, um, for 2016? Number one would be know the rules, uh, and particularly know now the amended rules, and take the time to carefully plead your case and get your evidence in correctly. I mean, if, if you read TTAB decisions frequently, you see time and again where parties go down simply because they didn't get their evidence in correctly. Um, another is registration of marks for products or services involving or related to the use of marijuana are going to be refused. We know that the board is continuing uh, to be reluctant to find fraud unless there's clear evidence of a specific intent to deceive the USPTO. In the post Bose world, fraud is still very much a non-starter. Another um, point is registration of surname marks. Um, it's challenging and the rulings are inconsistent. So um, if attempting to register a surname mark, uh, make sure to be very thorough in your arguments. And then last, on marks that have functionality issues, you've got to be careful about what you've got in your own past in terms of patents and claims in your advertising because you can end up being hoist on those petards. So I realize we're at the top of the hour and um, would like to take a moment to thank you all for attending today's presentation. Those who need to drop off, please feel free to do so. A replay of the webinar, including the full question and answer session, will be posted on our website within 48 hours. We'll also be um, posting a copy of the slides, as mentioned earlier. For those of you in New York and New Jersey, please download and complete the CLE form available in the handout section of the widget and send it to Lauren McGovern at McGovern at fr.com. And we'll continue answering questions for those of you that have a few extra moments and would like to stay on. Thanks again. And please don't hesitate to contact us with any questions. Um, do we have any questions in the widget? There was one uh, asking whether you can file an opposition, an opposition against the same owner for more than one trademark in a single filing electronically? And the answer to that is yes. That's already built into the ESTA form. You can name multiple marks in an inter partes uh, case right in your initial pleading. Any other questions? Okay, we'll um, Good. Well, I guess that's all we have today. Um, for those of you in New York and New Jersey, please make note of the course code and include it on the New York CLE form available in the handout section. And thank you again for joining us today. We appreciate your time, and we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks.